We're beginning a series. And you're here right at the beginning. Inner City Press has covered the UN for some years. And a year ago, in February 2016, it was evicted physically from the building and reported for several days on the UN from this very park that we're in across the street from the UN. Through that door, eight guards threw Inner City Press in the street and threw its laptop on the ground, smashing it. In April, five boxes of UN files from an office right over there, 303, were placed right next to the bus stop. Uncensored, ousted from the UN's glass house for investigative reporting. From bringing cholera to Haiti and lying about it, to two ongoing bribery cases, to dropping the Saudi-led coalition from the United Nations Children in Armed Conflicts Annex for bombing Yemen, how did the UN fall so far, so fast? This is one story unpacked. Quotation marks. That is to say, first person. It was the fifth year of the Syrian war. I'd covered each of it from the United Nations, like Libya and Sri Lanka before that. This Friday afternoon, February 19th, 2016, Turkey's threat to intervene in Syria was on the UN Security Council's agenda. From my longtime shared office, S-303, I watched on in-house Easy TV, the Security Council stakeout, until the first ambassador showed up. I headed down the escalator with audio recorder and smartphone, ready to live stream their answers on Periscope. I had my questions ready. I leaned down to swipe by my UN ID on the turnstile, but this time it didn't work. The UN security officer on duty gestured for me to come over. I'll let you through for now, but you need to talk to Malu. There was a guy here talking about you. Malu is the UN's media accreditation liaison unit, from which I and other correspondents had to request a pass renewal every year. For me, there had, always been, there had already been several attempts to review my accreditation, the phrase Voice of America used in its request, or to condition reaccreditation on more friendly coverage of the UN. I thanked the officer and set up shop in the Security Council stakeout area. Once the Syria meeting began, I went up the steps and through the glass doors of Malu's office. The acting head of the office was in his cubicle. Somehow my past didn't work, I told him. I want to find out why. I'll look into it, he said. Meet me up at your office. When I went up the escalator, I found in front of my office door, the door of my shared office, five UN security officers. I have a letter for you, said one, handing me an envelope. It had the UN seal on it. I don't have time for this, I told him. You're not going to read it? I really think you should read it, he said. I tore open the envelope and looked at the letter. It was signed by Christina Gayach, the head of the UN Department of Public Information, who'd taken over who'd taken over a year ago, but with whom I'd almost never spoken, other than to question her about her links to the Eng Lapsang UN bribery case. Some lines jumped out at me. The incident, quote unquote, of January 29th, UN media accreditation guidelines. Turn in your office key by 5 p.m. This is bogus, I said. I put the letter down on the floor and took a photo of it with my phone. I'm going to tweet this BS letter out, I said, hearing my own voice quiver. This lady is out of her mind. So, are you going to give us the key? An officer asked. No, I said. I'm going back down to do my job, covering the, the secure Syria meeting. The first officer told the second one to follow me downstairs. From now on, I would have a minder, and things would soon grow worse. There's the U.S. mission, ostensibly the guardian of freedom of the press, which fell down dramatically during the time of these events. For the Syrian stakeout in front of the UN Security Council on February 19, 2016, seemingly my last one, I tried to blend in. It wasn't easy with a UN security officer following my every move. But as I stood typing and tweeting and stepped up, stepping up to the stakeout railing every time someone came out to speak on the microphone, I put in two questions to Turkey's ambassador, who always traveled with a bodyguard, then returned to my laptop to transcribe them. By then, most of the other reporters had left. A UN security supervisor came and told me, So you'll be leaving, eh? I didn't agree to any of it, any of it I told him. But I'm trying to arrange for a van to move some of my stuff from my office. Just the most important stuff. Not because I accept being thrown out, but because I don't trust this place anymore. 
All right, then, the supervisor said. So you'll get yourself a van. He walked away. I did send out some emails, including to Jose Ramos Corte, who, beyond the UN job he had, was a Nobel Peace Prize winner. I told him I was being thrown out and to email Christina Gayach, who had signed the letter. To my surprise, he wrote back quickly and said that he would. By then, two other security officers came over. Look, one of them told me, don't make trouble. I say this as your friend. They have 15 of us on this, so pack up and live to fight another day. I nodded. I was wondering how Gayach would, what Gayach would do if a Nobel Peace Prize winner was asking her about it. Just to be sure, I plugged in my phone and put it on the riser next to me, filming and live-streaming the scene and replica of Bocasio's Guernica to the side of the Security Council stakeout on this very phone on Periscope. Ramos Horta wrote back, saying that Gayach told him I would still have the same access, access as a reporter, not only in office, just not only in office anymore. He forwarded me her response and said that I could use it. And here it is. Dear Mr. Ramos Horta, many thanks for your message, which allows me to inform you about the decision I have taken on the type of accreditation that Mr. Lee has and will have in the future. Recently, Mr. Lee openly broke the rules that guide all resident correspondents. After careful consideration of the internal report elevated to me, stopping for a moment. They, they later said they had no report when asked for one. I decided to continue providing him with a press pass, which allows him to work without any impediments at the UN, as the vast majority of journalists. What the UN cannot do is to let him use an office exclusively for him after the mentioned events. What events? As you can see, Mr. Lee will have a valid press pass as soon as he presents himself to the accreditation premises. Rest assured, I am the first person to be interested in ensuring total freedom and safety and reporting from UNHQ and about the UN. This is what Mr. Lee will be able to do. Just then, the security supervisor came back, this time with eight other officers. That's it, the supervisor said. Party's over. One of the guards grabbed my phone, yanked it off the wire, and pushed all the buttons trying to stop it from filming. Video here. Hey, don't touch my phone, I said. It's over, the supervisor said. He grabbed the ID badge around my neck and tore it off. You're a trespasser now. If you resist, we'll hand you over to NYPD. I'm a journalist here for 10 years, I started to say. We're a journalist, the supervisor said. Come on, we're leaving. Another of the guard had grabbed my laptop. Let me go upstairs and get my passport, I said, and my coat. The guards were pushing me toward the escalator, one heading down, not up. One flight down in the lobby, I saw two members of the board of the UN Correspondents Association. I had quit two years before, after being ordered by the UNCA pre president to take an article offline. Great job, I yelled at them. You're the UN Censorship Alliance. More walking, less talking, the supervisor said. I decided I should at least know his name, so I asked three times. I'm the deputy chief, he said. You're not going to give me your name, I told him. Even NYPD has to do that. He paused. McNulty, he finally said. Audio here. Then he added... Then again the pushing, out onto the traffic circle, toward the guard booth at the front, which checked the cars coming into the UN garage. You know why they're doing this, I said to the officer next to me, or to all of the officers. It's because of corruption. A guy's been indicted for paying bribes to the UN. When I asked if Ban Ki-moon's involved, suddenly he's having you throw me out. Enough, enough, McNulty said. We'd arrived at the guard booth, and one of the guards opened the metal gate onto First Avenue. I'm not leaving without my phone, I said. My mind was swimming. We'll give, we'll give it to you once you're out, McNulty said. And with that pushed me out of, out of the gate. I saw my backpack thrown on the ground with my laptop in it. Someone handed me my phone and suddenly the gate was locked. To the side, I saw the voice of America, which had tried earlier to get me thrown out of the UN. When I told them that they, if they used taxpayers' money to throw an American journalist out of the UN, it might be a problem. That's a threat, she told me. It's just a statement of the law, I told her. It's in the First Amendment. But the First Amendment, I'd found, ends at First Avenue. This is First Avenue, and that all took place. After being thrown out of the UN by eight security guards for trying to cover an event in the UN press briefing room, I was back on First Avenue first thing on Monday morning, trying to get signed into the UN as a guest by another correspondent. But at the door for the pass and sign in office, one security officer told us he'd been asked to be on the lookout for just this. You can wait inside, the guard said. But I have to call my supervisor. It was nearly 8 a.m. when the Security Council's meeting would start. I looked in my notebook for spokesman Stefan Dujarek's phone number and dialed it. We got voicemail. I left a message. I am being blocked from entering even as a guest. Then the officer's supervisor showed up. Matthew Sullivan was his name. I'd written about him before, not unsympathetically, after he got his rib broken by Turkey's Erdogan's bodyguard out of control. Ban Ki-moon ended up apologizing to Erdogan for the incident and putting Sullivan on paid leave, another of Ban Ki-moon's profiles and courage. 
But Sullivan's was in a Sullivan was in a fighting mood today. Come on, Maddie, he told me. You know you can't be in here. You're banned from all UN premises. Audio here. Please check it out and click it. Actually, I didn't know that. I told him all I wanted to do at that point was to try to cover the Security Council meeting by watching the webcast. Could I do it from in here? No, you have to leave, Sullivan said. Next thing I knew, I was out on First Avenue again. Yet another UN correspondent called me and I told him what was happening. I always thought they'd do this to you, he said. I just wonder why it took them so long. I got to the park on 43rd Street. That's right where I'm sitting now, by the way. Right across from the UN. Ralph Bunchy Park, they call it. And I set up shop on the base of a metal monument there. That's this right here. The UN's Wi-Fi didn't even reach out to the street. So I used my cell phone's hotspot. I uploaded the audio of Sullivan saying, You're banned from all UN premises. I tried to listen and live tweet to the Security Council's meeting on Syria. Finally, I watched the day's noon briefing. Dujaric, from his mushroom-like wooden podium, called on seemingly eternal UN Correspondents Association board member Masood Haider of Pakistan's Daily Dawn. I want to know about that blogger, Matthew Lee, Masood said. He's spewing all kinds of allegations on the Internet, some of them not true. What's his status? Video here. This is all true. Dujarak welcomed this question, this colloquy, and replied, Matthew should come back in and remove his belongings. I sat in the park across the street, now shouting at my laptop. I was told I couldn't enter the UN. How could they use the UN's briefing room to talk about my accreditation status without any right to reply? There was, of course, Twitter, and I used it. Soon my phone was out of power and my hotspot was growing weak. I had to find another place to work and headed inland. The public library on 46th Street had a second floor with children's books and some raised tables looking across the street at a restaurant called Oretsky's Patroon. I plugged in my laptop and kept plugging. This would not be a short fight. It was starting to dawn on me, like Pakistan's Daily Dawn. From the public library on 46th Street, I started writing to all of the UN officials I knew to be continued. And it will be, because I wrote to all of them. And while some responded, the shameful non-action by many shall be recorded. It was Ban Ki-moon's UN that used eight security officers to throw me into First Avenue without resistance and break my laptop. But it was Ban's head of communications who had signed the letter, so I decided I needed to speak with her. But being banned from the UN, how to do it? I'd noticed an email from UNESCO, some event in the lobby with Irina Bakova, then Ban's wannabe successor. I RSVP'd, then walked from the 46th Street Public Library to the UN at dusk. At the entrance stood a woman from UNESCO. A UN security officer came closer. They checked the list. There was my name, Matthew Russell Lee. The security officer shrugged. I went through the metal detector and into the lobby with its checkerboard floor and table stacked high with crackers, cheese, and fruit. Bakova was a no-show, but I saw Gayach talking with Edmund Millay, band's chief of staff who had overseen the introduction of cholera into Haiti while he was band's envoy there and had denied it ever since. It was time to make my move. Miss Gayach, I began. I think we got off on the wrong foot. She gave a fake seeming smile gesturing for her factotum, Darren Ferrant, to come over. Him, I knew. He'd been in my meetings with Gayach's predecessor, Peter Lonsky Tiffenthal, including when Lonsky, out of character, ordered me to remove from the door of my office the free UN coldest for access sign. This did not bode well. With Darren Ferrant as a witness, Gayach said, there are rules and they have to be followed. I asked, what rule did I break? This seemed to stump her. You know, she said, I'm sure you know. But I don't. I was just trying to cover a meeting in the UN press briefing room. I know, Gayach cut in, just like you stood outside the Unka Ball down on Wall Street in December. Now I remembered seeing her there, even exchanging a few lines. You see, I told her, it's nothing new. I think Unka is involved in the UN corruption scandal. 
Gaiach rolled her eyes. I even felt I felt even my chance to plead slipping away. Look, I'm a simple person, I told her. I'm willing to do penance, physical penance. I could clean the UN basement or move furniture around. I just need full access back to do my job. You should have thought of that before, she said smugly. When, I said, before I went into the UN press briefing room? Malay came back over and shepherded Gayach away. I went to where I'd set up my laptop and searched again online. The BuzzFeed piece was online, quoting unnamed Unka officials that I tried to spy on their meetings. Spying on journalists in the UN press briefing room? It still seemed so absurd to me that I still thought it could quickly be turned around. But that was not to be. The reporting on corruption hit a nerve, and now they would strike back with impunity. There is no law at the UN. The First Amendment stops at First Avenue. And that's where we find ourselves a year later, absolutely corrupt. Christina Gayach, Stefan Dujaric, Ferhan Hawk, new Secretary General Antonio Guterres is aware. A journalist was thrown in the street for reporting factually on corruption since verified in the Southern District of New York. It has still not been reversed.